six, one hundred sixty L four, two L four, two hundred fifty one feeling, one hundred eighty seven, one hundred ninety one, two hundred forty seven, two hundred seventy, two hundred seventy one, two hundred, two hundred eight. 280 definition of two two hundred of two hundred of two hundred of two hundred function of in function of in function of 272 negligible 275 and 80 180 180 180 180 344 haunted by everlasting order 340 distinct from conceptual feelings woman Supplement, two women, 213L4 Intelligence, 168. Gation, 100, 107, 107, 107, ill, 213, as God's aim, 67, 88, defected by proposition, 200, 200, intensity, the intensity, minor, 15, as self-justifying, 6, Future and future 27 277 to 73 83 83 83 84 116 and order 83 84 to 85 98 100 339 height Nation inorganic, 98, 102, 103, 107, 100, 100, 188 insight, 4, 9, 15 infectio, 49. Editors, preface. Process and reality, Gnomopus, Agnomopus is one of the major philosophical works of the modern world, and an extensive body of secondary literature has developed around it. Yet surely no significant philosophical book has appeared in the last two centuries so the poorly many hundreds of errors 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 and with over 300 discrepancies between the American Macmillan and the English Cambridge editions which appeared in that's with divergence with divergent paginations. The work itself is highly technical and far from easy to understand, and in many passages the errors in those editions were such as to compound the difficulties. The need for a corrected edition has been keenly felt for many decades. The principles to be used in deciding what sorts of corrections ought to be introduced into a new edition of process and reality are not, however, obvious. Settling upon these principles requires that one take into account the attitude toward book production exhibited by Whitehead, the probable history of the production of this volume, and the two original editions of the text as they compare with each other and with other books by Whitehead. We will discuss these various factors to provide background in terms of which the reader can understand now for the editorial we have made, decisions we have made, we have made. Whitehead did not spend much of his own time on the routine tasks associated with book production. Professor Raphael Demos was a young colleague of Whitehead on the Harvard faculty at the time, 1925, of the Publiance and the Science and the Modern World. Demos worked over the manuscript editorially, read the proofs, and did the index for that volume. The final sentence of Whitehead's preface reads, my most grateful thanks are due to my colleague Mel Demos for reading Demos for reading Demos for reading the proofs and for the suggestion of many improvements in expression. 
After retiring from Harvard in the early 1960s, Nemos became for four years a colleague at University of University of Professor Sherburn and shared with him his personal observations concerning Whitehead's indifference to the production process. Bertrand Russell L. provides further evidence of Whitehead's sense of priorities when he reports that Whitehead, in response to Russell's calm, one portrait from mem portraits from memory, New York, Simon and Schuster, Knight P. P. 104. P. Editor's preface. P. Claimed that he had not answered a letter, justified himself by saying that if he answered letters, he would have no time for original work. Russell found this complete and unanswerable. In 1929, when the process and reproduction, the station, the same sense of priorities was operative. Whitehead was 68 and he still and he still had major projects maturing in his mind. Adventures of ideas, modes of thought, and numerous articles and lectures were still to come. The original work, a court precedent take precedence in precedence in his life over humdrum details and trivia. Unfortunately, However, 1929 found demos in England working with Russ. As best we can determine at this time, no one with both a familiarity with Whitehead's thought and an eye for detail undertook to shepherd process and reality through the production process. In particular, in particular, was never aware that anyone else from the philosophical community had worked on the manuscript or proofs. Acknowledgement in the preface in the preface in the preface is to the constant encouragement and counsel which I owe to my wife. And in an examination of the available evidence, including the discrepancies between the two original editions and the types of errors they contain, has led us to the following reconstruction of the production process and of the origin of some of the types of errors. First, to some extent in conjunction with the preparation of his Gifford lectures and to some extent as an expansion and revision of them, T. Whitehead prepared a handwritten manuscript. Many of the, er many of the, er many of the errors in the final product, such as incorrect references, misquoted poetry, other faulty quotations, faulty and inconsistent punctuation, and some of the wrong and missing words, surely originated at this stage and were due to white attention to deep attention to details. In addition, the inconsistencies in formal matters were undoubtedly due in part to the fact that the manuscript and was written the and was written over a period of at least a year and a half. Second, a typist possibly at Macmillan prepared a typed copy for the printer. The errors that crept into the manuscript at this stage seem to include, besides the usual sorts of typographical errors, misreadings of Whitehead's somewhat difficult hand. Point three, for example, initiating wh initiating Whitehead's capital H was sometimes transcribed as A T, so that his came out this and here came out there. Also, not only the regular mistranscription of monodology, monodology, but also other mistranscriptions, such as transmuted, per, transmitted, and goal, per, those, probably occurred at this stage. Professor Victor Lowe. To see Victor Lowe, Whitehead's Gifford Lectures, the Southern Journal of the last volume, volume, 7, number 4, winter, 1969-70, 329-38. Three for samples of his handwriting letters published in Alfred Lord and Alfred North Whitehead, essays on his philosophy, ed. George L. 
Klein, New York. Prentice Hall, 1960, 197, and the philosophy of Alfred North Whitehead, ed. Hall Arthur Schilt, 2nd ed. New York. Tudor Publishing, 1951 pp. 66,465. P. 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 Has reported an incident which, whether or not it involved a misreading of Whitehead's handwriting, provided as Lowe says a bad omen for what would happen to the book. On April 11, 1928, Kemp Smith received this. Cable from Whitehead. Title Gifford Lectures is process and reality syllabus following shortly by mail WHITCHCHCAD. 4. 3rd. 3rd. It appears that Macmillan set type first and that Cambridge set its edition a bit later, using either a copy of the typed manuscript or, more likely, a copy of Macmillan's proof sheets. There are a large number of air editions had two editions had in common, a large number in the Macmillan edition which were not in the Cambridge edition, and some few in the latter which were not in the former. Their distribution and their character suggest the following observations. Macmillan provided poor proofreading, the Cambridge editor did a much more rigorous job of catching typers, errors. The Cambridge editor also initiated certain sorts of editorial changes, which primarily involved punctuation, though these were not consistently applied throughout the entire text. Finally, this unique of errors unique to the Cambridge edition seem not to be due to carelessness, but to deliberate attempts to make the text more intelligible attempts which felt Cambridge editor Cambridge editor did, Cambridge editor did not understand Whitehead's technical concepts. There, there is independent evidence himself saw himself saw proofs. Will has published a letter from Whitehead to his son, dated August 12, 1929, which reads in part, At last I have got through with my Gifford Lecture's final proofs corrected, index printed, and the last corrections put in. 5. The deplorable state of the text, plus Whitehead's lack of enthusiasm for this sort of work, make it virtually certain that he did not do much careful proofreading. Will reports 6 that Whitehead, after this, cushions with C. He cited to change to change cited to change the adjectival form of category from categorical to categorical and made this of the galley throughout the galleys. We strongly suspect that Whitehead's work on the proofs was limited for the most part to very particular, specific corrections of this sort. It would have been useful in the preparation of this corrected edition to have had Whitehead's manuscript and or typescript. Unfortunate efforts have been unsuccessful and unsuccessful and unsuccessful both are probably no longer extant. We do have some corrections, additions, and marginalia which Whitehead himself added to his Cambridge and Macmillan copies. In addition there is a one-page list entitled, Misprints, evidently given to Whitehead by someone else, with an endorsement in Whiting, correct writing, corrections all inserted. This data was given to us by Lowe, who is writing the authorized biography of Whitehead and has been given access to family materials, and to whom we have been, Deation, Four low, op CIT, 334, FN, 14, 5 IBID, 338, 6 IBID, FN, 19, as low reports, he received this information from H. N. Lee. P. 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 
Finally, in 1966 Lowe was allowed by Mrs. Henry Copley Green to see a typescript of Which I, which was inscribed, Rosalind Green with his love from Alfred Whitehead October 12, 1928. This typescript had some corrections in Whitehead's hand on it. Will reports that, with one exception, the published texts contain these corrections, e.g., the capitalization of creature and itself in the last paragraph. It was on the basis of the above evidence and interpretations the principle that the principles that guided our editorial work in regard to both the more trivial and the more significant issues. The most difficult and debatable editorial decisions had to be made, ironically, concerning relatively trivial matters, especially those involving punctuation. A middle course or a middle course for middle course between two unacceptable extremes. On the one hand, the editors of a corrected edition might have introduced into the text all the changes which they would have suggested to a still living author. The obvious problem with this alternative is that, since the author is no longer living, he would have no chance to veto these improvements as being inconsistent with his own meaning or references. references. On the other hand, to avoid this problem the editors might have decided to remove only the most obvious and egregious errors, otherwise leaving the text as it was. One problem with this alternative wouldn't work would, wouldn't work would again be published without benefit of the kind of careful editorial work Whitehead had every right to expect work which the Cambridge editor began but did not carry out consistently. Another problem is that there are over 300 divergencies between the two original editions. In these places it is impossible simply to leave the text as it was a choice must be made. In Murley, in most of these places the Cambridge punctuation is preferable and must be followed if you be totally irresponsible to revert to Macmillan's punctuation. But once Cambridge's punctuation has been followed in these places, the question arises, how could one justify accepting Cambridge's improvements in these instances and yet not make similar improvements in parallel passages? Accordingly, in trying to steer a middle course between these two extremes we decided that the most responsible plan of action would be to take the changes introduced by the Cambridge editor, which, of course, were made during Whitehead's lifetime and could have been vetoed in his personal copies as precedents for the kinds of changes to be carried out consistently. A prime example is provided by the fact that Cambridge believes